this afternoon we're going to focus on um this is a wee outline of our session so we're going to look at uh, where digital design sits within the curriculum looking at design with creativity um, at its heart we're then going to look at what 3d models because we are going to look at 3d design predominantly this afternoon um, and how you can create models and use them with learners um, we're going to talk a little bit about Tinkercad. Uh, like I said, that's our focus and that's a free piece of software and we'll talk about that when we're looking at it. And I'll give you a wee run through of how it works um, in principle and how you can use it. Um, we're then also going to just touch on, but not demonstrate, but I'll show you where to get links to, um, resources that we already have around Microsoft models, 3D Paint and um, Gravity Sketch, which is again is another app. So um, all of these apps that we're showing you today work on a range of platforms and devices. There's only one that is um, device specific, but we'll touch on all of that. If there's anything that we are not covering that you think, you know what, I really wanted to know about that, please pop it in the chat. Again, we'll try and make sure we cover it. I can't see the chat, but um, Dawn is monitoring it and will let me know. So, um, moving on. Within the national context, as many of you will know, in 2016, we published our updated technologies curriculum. Um, and uh, Gemma, who's on the call, was also involved in that work. So it's lovely to see her along here. Um, we looked at refocusing. We've put a lot more depth into what is expected of learners from early years right through. Um, and we've also produced, and if you've not seen this, this document called What Digital Learning Might Look Like. Where this differs from benchmarks and experiences and outcomes, it gives you examples of just as it says, what learning might look like in a classroom. So where it's talking about um, using a model or using um, 3D models in your classroom, it might give you some examples that you may not have considered yet. So if you haven't seen it, the next slide, don't worry, has an image of a QR code that you can scan to take you straight there, but it's available from Education Scotland National Improvement Hub. Obviously, in how good is our school, which all of us know back to front, um, and how good is our early years um, and child learning and childcare setting, these documents, when they were published, they again pushed digital right up there. So I'm talking a lot this afternoon about creativity and design, and they don't necessarily need digital, and I can't emphasize that enough, like start analog, build in digital, or the other way around, they don't need each other exclusively. However, um, it's really great to see that digital, the expectation around digital tools and digital um, collaboration is really prominent in both these documents. But more than that, digital creativity is at the heart of them. And one of the other documents that you'll all be familiar with if you're early years um, is raising, uh, realizing the ambition in the BME document. And again, 6.5 in that document talks a lot about um, uh, digital tools that can expand learners' experiences. And I have a little quote that's coming up shortly. So it's really important that we're not just looking at digital literacy, but we're looking at it within that wider picture. And digital creativity is a brilliant way to do that. So um, I promised, follow the hashtag WDLMLL, trips off the tongue. Um, and you can see some examples of what we've shared around what digital learning might look like. But if you again haven't seen that booklet, this is your opportunity to grab this scan. I do have a PDF that as soon as this call finishes, the PDF of this presentation will be in the file space of the team that we're in at the moment. So you'll be able to access it and it's all hyperlinked for you. So within the curriculum, um, the E's and O's, we have a range of early um, E's and O's um, that apply to the work that we're looking at today. So we've got all the standard ones. So we've got design and construct models. So again, early years, we would have our um, building blocks out. We would have um, the see-through um, shapes. We'd be using these in a range of ways. We'd also be linking um, sort of aspects of these learnings across all of the sort of groups and areas in our environments. We're looking at these specific E's and O's today. So we're going to cover um, how we can use models and create new concepts for things. And that's one of the aspects that Tinkercad can lend itself really nice to, nicely to. So again, thinking about our local environment and how we, what changes we might want to make. Again, learners, depending on the age and stage of them, can do this at home. 
Um, and these are themes that go right the way through the E's and O's. We're looking at representing our ideas in different ways. So often we would get draw a picture or we would make a physical model, but we're just expanding that a little bit by making it a virtual model in this case. Um, and we're going to construct a model and again, moving away from that um, physical sense to the online. So we may start physically and then move online or we may do the learning backwards lesson plan style and we might start with our um, concept and work back. So it goes right the way through. So again, I'm glad I've got some seed sticking to staff on here because we have gone right up to the third level, but it does expand up to the fourth. So you can see this fault flows right through. And as I've mentioned, the two that we're focusing on are highlighted in orange there today. So I mentioned the realising the ambition to be a me document. So I really love this quote and I think it kind of summarises what I'm hoping that maybe after today you might want to use these tools for. So digital technologies provides us an opportunity to design unique learning spaces for children. But it's the next bit that I love specifically, bringing resources virtually to the setting. Now, when we think about bringing things virtually, we often think about Skype calls and they are amazing. They, they open up the world um, when we're doing maybe Skyping, um, Skyping with Microsoft, their event every year. But we're also thinking about virtual reality headsets and all sorts. What I like about this is we are bringing sense of virtuality to our classroom because we can be creating a model or we can be sourcing a model. Lots of organisations have models that they have freely available on a range of sites or will email you if you're doing a project with them based on museums and libraries, galleries that are beside you. And you can use them virtually to expand learners' experiences and understanding of a concept or um, a learning experience. So it's about moving beyond just what it literally says. And, and like I say, it's that whole virtual aspect that is really nice about this. We can obviously also print all of these things that we're going to create, but you would require a 3D printer. Um, so where do the tools be? Where, when you're um, learning about modelling in early years, what does that lead on to for our youngest learners? So these are tools and skills that are used in a wealth of um, roles across the world. The board so we've got things like architecture and town planning and we know that we've seen architects models on um, in real life and in films if you're near me I'm at the BNA so they have an amazing model of their structure but it's also in things like heritage and fashion and manufacturing so things like car manufacturing if you think how uh, much it costs to create a prototype of a car so if we went back even 20 30 years that would have to all be done physically Fashion would have created um, a whole series of clothing to see if it would work, but now that could all be done in an online environment. And our young people have the tools um, available to them for, for all of, again, all the stuff we're showing you is free. So that allows them to gain those skills and then they can hone that as they go through school um, and through uh, secondary to get that increased skill level of using them appropriately. So we're being creative with them and then we're looking at arts and culture, film industry, you know, again, big budget films, they're not going to spend millions of pounds blowing stuff up. So it's all done virtually. And again, if we can let our young people see how they can create a model for perhaps small worlds play, and that's one of the things we'll look at this afternoon, then there's nothing stopping them then creating um, a product when they go into secondary and they're using tech, they're going to tech, technical design classes and then into the film industry to create those models and earn money doing that. And then obviously tourism, because they don't have to be somewhere, um, they can create it and it can be um, used in a whole wealth of ways to support tourism. Again, if people want to know um, or maybe have links out to these, SDS is a great place. I'm really happy if I know people that are in any of these fields and this is something you want to develop further, I'm really happy for you to get in touch with me and I can see what I can do about pointing in the right direction. So where does that sit within creativity? So creative thinking is the kind of key to all of these things. And all of those careers kind of fall into these kind of bands a little bit that I've put into this triangle. So if you haven't seen the Adobe Creativity resources, I would suggest you to do a Google search after that. If you've not seen it, they've got some brilliant stuff. Creative thinking is at the heart of it. And that feeds then into three different types of uh, think, uh, design. So we've got design thinking, and then we've got engineer design. And artistic design and when we think about creating um, anything 
the design thinking is looking at the sort of desirability, the viability and the feasibility of it. So if they're recreating something for their learning environment or their playground, it would be looking at, well, who wants it doing that whole survey? Is it viable to test this out? So we maybe want a climbing frame made of gold. Is that viable? We can link that out. And then is it feasible? Is it going to work? The engineering stuff is looking at the structure of it and um, how it can be adapted to the environment it's in and would it be suitable and looking at the trade-off. So again, that whole co 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 can't speak, co collaboration and cooperation. Um, and then the artistic design is looking at the sort of emphasis, balance um, and contrast. So making it aesthetically pleasing um, and having that whole creative free spirit to look at does it have to be done the way it's always been done? That is a really strong thing. I should also point out at this point, we are also doing one that is focusing on things more around the design principles, so balance, alignment, proportion of actually creating things with the V&A, and that's coming up in March. So again, if this is an area where creative design thinking is something you want to look more at, we are doing a further session next month. So moving on now. And using creative models, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, is how can these activities, um, how can activities using or creating models support learners? Well, we might be talking about um, working with some really delicate artifacts. So if you're doing a topic on like um, a historical based topic, maybe it's primary one and they're learning around um, a historic based thing, you might want to get artifacts in, but you wouldn't maybe want them to handle the real objects, they may be worth a lot of money. So you can recreate them um, using models. I know, as I mentioned, lots of um, museums and galleries have model artifacts that they can either send you or um, can email you. Um, so again, it informs understanding. We can remove barriers to access. Just now we're all working in a whole wealth of ways and our young people are at home. And, and again, thank you for joining us because I know that if you are early years, you may have learners coming back into you next week um, because of the announcement yesterday. So I really appreciate you giving up your evening. But so for some young people, they might never be able to access something because it's too far away or, or we can't do it. So we can access them remotely this way. And it brings our objects to life. So, um, so it's really nice way for them to create something in their mind. Maybe it's a story prompt. Maybe um, it's a, an addition to their small world play resources that they'd like to build, and it's it's a way to nicely do that. Okay, so um, touching on why these are again important, linking it back to the science, and we will get shortly onto the the topic um, that we're looking at is. Metacognition looks at independent learning strategies. Um, and again, there's a webinar recording on its way out from one that we did last week. Um, but they've broken it down with the EEF into three of the categories, so plan, monitor, and evaluate. And that's kind of what we do with our lessons. But when our young people are designing something, they would plan it out, they would test it, and then they would evaluate it. So looking at that within the actual design process, you can see how our independent metacognition strategies that we're trying to teach our young people that be independent by planning, monitoring, evaluate and revising and um, using retrieval practice strategies links really clearly over to the design, pro the design sort of flow of plan, research and develop what you wanted to do. So go out, maybe find um, environmental clues, etc. that you want, look at the resources that you want, apply them and create the resource that you want, and then review it, um, review how that application went, and then reapply, test it, and change essentially what we're doing there. And then you've got your completed activity. So essentially, it's the same follow through that we have with the metacognition strategy. So what are 3D models? A really, really quick whiz to do what a 3D model is before we get onto the sort of fun bit of making them. So a 3D model is basically a representation of any object. It's mathematical because it has exact points. So these are like mil like even smaller than millimeters. It can be taken from a scan and the scan is meshed together. Um, so it can represent, as it says there, the surface and it is basically anything. So you could do a room, you could do an object, um, or it could be something that's been created. Um, they're created by 3D modelers and artists, 
um, and they're often, as I mentioned again earlier, used in computer games. So there are um, two different kinds of models. There's a solid model, and again, this is often used in engineering medical simulations, and it has an exact and very precise um, set of data within it. There's also, and this is what we're going to create, a shell model. So it's got the surface, but it's hollow. So essentially, the best way to describe a shell 3D model is if you think of a chair that you've draped a blank over, you can see the outline of it, you know exactly what's there, but you don't have the exact measurements of the containers, everything within it. It's not showing you the internal structure. So they're the kind of two main things. And schools have a huge range of software available. So Blender, if you're a school with a code club, they have a ton of stuff for Blender um, to introduce you to. Autodesk, if you're secondary or you're more senior. Gravity Sketch is one of the apps we're going to talk about later on. And Microsoft Paint as well can allow you to create 3D models. <coughs> I'm also going to show you where you can add them into a PowerPoint. Or more importantly, your young people can add them in. So that leaves us to our Autodesk demo. But before I do, does anyone have any questions at all about what we've shared or has anybody used Autodesk uh, or to Tinkercard rather? John, anything? There's none at nobody at the moment. No There's the nothing moment. in the chat yet. Just feel oh, free oh, to pop oh. in the chat if you have. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So um oh so a couple of people are saying they have Brilliant. So as I say, this is an introduction session. So if you know some of this, then please just bear with us um, and uh, please feel free to pop in how you've used it as well. We'd love to know the it. So Tinkercad is owned by Autodesk. Now it didn't used to be it was bought over by them. It's a free bit of software and it's web enabled. So um, essentially you go to tinkercad.com and you are in the site. Before you even go in, I wanted to show you a couple of pieces and then I'll show you how to build it. So what I love about it is really user friendly. If you're looking to learn how to use it, you simply go to the section learn. You can scroll down and it does three things. So we're going to focus on models at the moment, but I do want to highlight this. So this is the area we're going to look at today. But um, it also has uh, components built into it to support learning around circuits and electronics. So again, it, that can be creating a virtual circuit in a sandbox, so an online um, environment. So again, if you're trying to teach circuits to your kids and they're not going to likely have batteries and crocodile clips and light bulbs and all that, you can do it virtually through this. It works as a simulator. I love it. It's so good. It's really useful to know when we are back in school as well because often if you were anything like my classes, my more senior classes that I had, you would always end up, it didn't matter how many times you checked it, you'd always end up with like at least two bulbs that didn't work even though you checked them. So having this as a virtual simulation can be really beneficial. And it also has code blocks built in. So you can create something then you can program it, you can um, create, program the build of it and so on. For yourself, beyond this session, it has some um, core training mo um, modules that you can do. They're really simple and it talks you through them. It's a really nice setup that they have. Once you've done those four, you kind of have the core skills, but we will cover a lot of them today. Um, you can click start tinkering or for learners, they would just come in, they would go to learn and they would click join your class if you create a class. So as with any software, if you're planning on using it with your class, we would always, always suggest that you speak to your local authority and check that you are um, GDPR compliant to use it and that the right paperwork is in place. What I would say is that when you create your class, you don't have to use any details at all about them. So you don't have to give a name, you don't have to give age, date of birth, they don't need an email. You would give them um, like a number or you could give them like a nickname. So, um, for example, Mickey Mouse, and I'll show you that in my class, I use Mickey Mouse. And then my young person would come in with a unique nickname that is just for them. So that's how they access it. So oh, I should just show you this one a bit here in Teach as well. 
again, it gives you some lesson plans. So again, if this is new to you and you're thinking that's great, we want to explore. And then once we've explored a little bit, we want to go into a little bit more depth, we can do that through this. So you can go in and again, it's got this breakdown of it in here. So primary age, um, primary to, um, they would count it as S1 um, and same here. And it has some additional information on sat setting up your class. So it's a really nice layout. So once you're in, this is what Tinkercad looks like. So I basically signed in and I've got my account, but I'll show you. All your designs appear in here. So you can see here, it lets you check if you've got the right model and if your whole class have them, all of the models for your class appear in here. So this is my account. I've not, I do have a class that I created yesterday, but um, it doesn't seem to have pulled it through, but we can see here all my models. And if I had Dawn as one of my members of my class, her models would also appear in here. Anytime I want to create a new model, just make sure I'm on 3D design and click new design. Perfect. If you have a second device with you, Dawn's popped the link in the chat. So please feel free to play along as we're doing this. So you'll see here, I've got my work plane that's on the surface and I control it by this little box here. So if you are using an interactive board, it is really simple. And again, I've done this with nursery kids right through to more senior pupils. Um, everybody seems to quite like this system. So the box up at the top allows you to rotate to the end and change the view of whatever you've added on. I've then got little buttons down the side. So um, at the side, I've got my home view button, which just resets everything. So if you've been playing around, it resets it. Underneath that, I've got a fit all. So once I open up a model, if I just click the Tinkercad lo logo, it takes me straight back to all my models. So we'll just open up one that I've already created. So tinker with this. So here's my model of my house. But I want to have the home view, I click that. If I want to fit everything into one view and zoom in a little bit, I click the, um, the fit all view and I can rotate it around. So again, my young people can explore what that might look like. If I want to zoom in, I can either use the roller, my trackpad or the plus and the same for zoom out, which is the minus. If I want to select a piece of my model, I can click it and I can zoom in, so it's switching the perspective view. So it lets me see a little closer. Change the perspective that I want to view it at. So if I was there checking if the, um, the hole in my chimney was appropriate and it was accurate, I can see it's off center. So that view that I've chosen allows me to do that slightly more than it was. When I'm happy with it, I can click home and it returns it. So to move your model around, it's really straightforward. Any questions so far on Tinkercad opening the account and the settings? No questions yet, Jenny. No problem. So some other features you'll see here, I've got a whole range of shapes at the side. So I'm just going to move this box. So um, I have a whole range of shapes at the side and Tinkercad comes with a whole lot of geometric modeling shapes. So I'm given the basic shapes that are here and I can choose from any of those. And I'm basically, when I'm creating a 3D model, I'm building something up from these basic geometric shapes. So for my young people, I'm developing an understanding of shape. We're developing our language around shape. We're also developing our understanding of measurement, depending on the age and stage and appropriateness. But we're developing positional language as well. So we're talking about where do we want our shapes to go over, under, etc. Within the shapes, I can choose this drop down menu and I can choose numbers and text. I can choose character features. So one of the models you might have seen there was a snowman that I had, and we've done this with the penguin parade that was um, around. So you can use some shapes and combine them, and I'll show you that in just a second. But you can see I have a lot of different shapes that I can combine to make nice, fun characters for my young people. So again, when we're thinking about characters prompts for stories, um, we can use that as a tool. 
and they have created it so they have ownership and if you are doing this for story writing it's a really nice way because often we all are aware that blank paper can be really challenging if we're working with our learners remotely again that can be a really challenging way for them to um, be sitting trying to think of a character for their story but this where they build it then gives them something to use their adjectives around okay so we also have connectors which are useful for this the science stuff and we can um, also um, look down here we can look and see that we have some principles so we can print parts of a skeleton and um, we have dinosaurs and we have models from the Smithsonian you can also create your own collections um, but we're going to stick with basics at the moment and characters so a couple of nice little things I thought I would show you oh I can see a question comes in do you need to create an account for people so absolutely not you don't need to create an account for people so before i close up for the at the end of the session i'll show you where to create um pupil um logins so don't worry we'll cover that so if i just at any time i finish with a model i don't need to hit save i don't need to do anything i just click the tinkercad logo so again it's nice and easy for my younger learners to to work with um I'm going to show you a couple of things. So I'm going to make um, a name badge because this is a really nice way as well for enterprise projects. If you do have access to 3D printers um, in maybe your feeder primary, if you're a nursery or early year setting, if you have a secondary that has one. Also, I would highlight that libraries across Scotland, although they're all closed at the moment, um, libraries across Scotland are part of a, a programme called SLIC. Um, and they have 3D printers that they can often work with schools with um, at a much, much reduced cost. So there is usually a really small charge for, for printing things, but it's definitely worth having that conversation with your local library. Um, they may not have one, it may be a central library, but please do have that conversation. So I've zoomed in on my work plane and I'm going to just create a really simple um, name, like we're going to make a little key thing. So I just dragged my shape over and you can see I get this pop up window. So I can use the presets here and I can type in numbers. What I tend to prefer to do is click on my shape and use the editing dots, just like you would on a Word document to move my shape around. I can see here that my shape is my grid is in millimeters and all my measurements are in millimeters too. And you can edit that, but it, it's inches rather than centimeters. So and just be aware of that so i can now see by grabbing that top dot dot and i can look at the arrows that give me these clues as well that my shape is eight millimeters deep so i'm going to make it 10 so one centimeter and i'm also going to see well i don't really like it being odd i quite like a nice round number so i will make it 10 centimeters across so one centimeter deep 10 centimeters if i want to rotate it around just click on the panel and swivel around so my key ring is going to be the keyhole so the first thing uh, for the, the ring tag so i'm just going to make this a bit longer so i can do it by the dots i can click on here to change the number with my keyboard or i can do that with the sliding bar i'm going to then pull on a cylinder so to make a hole in something i've got two different options i've got these two shapes up at the top which are um, a box obviously and a cylinder um, and because they're stripy we know that they are a hole so if i was to drag it over leave it where it is and spin around you can see that i now have like this space oops all the way through my shape that's a better view for you to see maybe so you can see that goes right the way through that's really useful to start with. Um, however, I'll show you this as well. So I've pulled this on and I can choose to make it stand out so it's much clearer by simply selecting this drop down window and choosing the color scheme that I want. So again, I can customize it, I can make it different colors, I can make it really personalized. I spin it around so it's accurate. I'm going to make it smaller just by grabbing a corner dot, maneuvering it around, and to raise it up or push it down, I've got this little turret, this little grab handle at the top. 
So on my Z axis, I'm basically able to push it down and you can see that more clearly there. It's gone through my shape, but I want it to be at zero. So when I'm clicking on my shape, I'm going to here, you can see it showed me at six millimeters under the ground. So I'm going to just hit zero and it's flat. I'm going to squish it down a little bit, zoom in using my fit view, and I'm now going to tell it I want it to be a hole. So I can do that. So now if I was to zoom out, you can see I've got a, key, a space for the key ring loop to go through. If I was to test this, we could probably find that it's too close, so I'm going to move it in a little bit. And now I can decide what I want on my actual key ring. So on here, we can have um, another shape, but we're going to put some text on. So I can add in individual letters, but here we're going to simply drag the word text on. I honestly love this. This is this is relatively new to this product about maybe a year and a bit ago. And until then, you had to have all your letters lined up. So click the text. So I can see there it's not that easy to see. So I'm going to change the color to be yellow. And now if I rotate around, although it looks from the front like it's on the, the object, I can see it's not. I'm going to drag it over. I can see that there's a bit of yellow and red, so I just need to maybe pull it up and make it slightly deeper as it is there. I also want it to go right down, so I'm going to stretch it all the way through my shape. If I was to do this with my young people, we could see the end of the letter and we would know that actually we need it to be slightly smaller. So we're going to make our shape bigger. Jenny, we have one I question from Miss Crichton. Can I just interrupt for a moment? Yeah. Is there any way to simplify the base plate image to have only one centimetre lines, for example? No, so it's millimetres. Um, so if I show you here, if you go to edit, you can change the units you choose are bricks, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, inches or millimeters, that's that's it. So you do have to use that. When you're working, when we're doing this with early years, as, as I know you'll you'll know, we would probably not focus too much on the number so much. We would be looking at more the design process, and then we could we could um, articulate the number and position it more accurately. But I'm afraid not. Sorry. Um, so we've got our um, letter on here and all I'm going to do is click on the word and I've now got this pop-up banner that says um, text. And if I was to put that here, I could put um, DD model and roll it up. Now, it's to, so I'm going to squish it down. I could use them if I've got more senior pupils. I would obviously do this mathematically, and we would work out the centre point, and we would um, look at the whole sort of overall maths aspect of it. But again, with my young people, we could be using their name, so we could be doing keyboard reinforcement a little bit with this. Um, so now I've got this on here. I can see it's kind of floating. It almost goes all the way through, so I'm just going to make it a bit deeper, and I want it to punch a hole right through. So I've made it a hole. And now it's there. So the next thing I need to do is at the moment, I could move all of these things individually, the whole work group of letters, the shape and the bottom. But I want to have them all move together. So I'm going to go all the way around my shape by just dragging with my mouse. You can see that red box hopefully appear. It's grabbed everything. And I have this little window of options up here. So the first one I'm going to do is group it. So now I know whenever I move this around on my base plate, if I go to my home view, I've now got one key ring that I could print off. And I can see right the way through to my base plate, so I know it's it's blank. If I wanted to uh, raise it up or turn it around, I should also show you this. So um, you'll see I've got these little arrows that appear at different places. And that allows me to change the, the axes that things are, are on. So I've got a rotational tool that allows me to rotate it. So if I wanted to, not that I probably would, but if I did for this example, want to rotate it, I can click on the object. I would, oops, there we go. 
go up and just swing around till I got it to the angle that I wanted it at. So we're going to look at that with the house that we could build next. So again, if I go back to basic shapes, and you can have more than one model on your base plate, or you can have multiples. So we'll stretch our box out. So we've now got our house, and we'll bring that into clearer view. Again, if I just want to tip around, I use the corner of my viewer box to check that I'm happy. If I was to raise it up off the ground, it would show me how high up it is, and that means that I can then just add zero in, and that puts it back on the ground. I click the front and home. I now want to add a roof on. So helpfully, they, they used to call this um, a wedge, but they have changed it to roof. So, um, so if I drag this one over, I can line it up. So again, my young people could be designing a house. Um, and again, um, they could be designing play park equipment. It could be whatever they want. So I've now created this house. I've got a nice little overhang for my eaves. And I need to raise it up. So I'm going to click on my box and I'm going to click on the top dot. Because that shows me it's five, well, five centimeters point two above the ground. So now if I click on my roof, I'm going to pull that up. And I want it to be just a little bit below because if I ever did print this, I'd need them to be attached so that they stick together. I'm then going to rotate my plane around because although it looks fine from the front, I can see it's far, far too now. This is not covering my house at all. No insurance provider will help me. So I'm going to deepen my object. And again, I could use my dots to check. So that one's 45. So we know we need our roof to be slightly bigger. And it is, it's 48. When I'm happy with it, I can rotate. It's maybe a bit excessive, so I'm going to shrink it down a little bit. And if I do something and I think I don't like that, I have an undo button and a redo button. I can also get rid of an object. So I can get rid of that or I can bring it back. And I can copy and repeat something. So we're going to do that with the windows. Jenny, that was one question. Can you copy and paste? Can you duplicate a model just so that you can change the text? So like the 3D one there, can you duplicate yeah. that? That's perfect, thanks. That was for Miss Cares. So I'll show you with the windows, but really quickly with this one, I would just click it, go up to this top corner, click on the copy button, the one that's lots of paper, so duplicate, and then it automatically sits on top of it. So you just drag it. Once you've dragged it, for this, because it's got writing on it, we would have to ungroup it, and then we would just click on the writing. I remember you see that. There we go. Click on the writing and it should let me, oh, I need to upgrade that as well. There we go, ungroup. And then I can change it, so test. So any, any model that you do has that ability. You can also use Control and D um, if you're a Windows user and that lets you copy something. So for our house, we want it to have a chimney. So we're going to grab the cylinder. We're going to pull it over and we're going to just lift it up and pull it across. So again, you can see for younger learners, they're not having to worry too much. But again, if you've got slightly older learners, you could be quite sort of fastidious in this. So we've got our model. We're going to squish it down just a bit and we're going to make it a bit, oops, no bit deeper and a bit smaller. There we go. And you can just keep playing around until you're completely satisfied. Exactly what I just demonstrated with the keyring, this time to make a hole, rather than um, pull another cylinder on and try and match it, I'm going to click on my cylinder that I'm using for my chimney, control D, and you see it flash, so I know I've got another one, and I'm going to just shrink it. And if you look very carefully, you'll see the line. I don't know. I'm hoping it's picking it up. Yes. Um, you can see there that it's moving it around. And I can just choose where I want them to sit. Select the inside one and tell it that it's a hole. I could make them two different colors as well. Um, 
So now I have this little chimney inside the bigger chimney. So my young people could put like, they could make little um, cotton wool smoke to come out of it and things. I can then go back and I can repeat the process. So we can give ourselves, um, we can use a different box. And if we wanted, we could do like a hobbit kind of roof where it was curved and add it in, but we're in a bit short of time. So I'm going to make this box yellow just so I can see it. I'm going to um, make it a bit smaller. So it's a bit less shallow, but it's a bit taller for my door. So I'm going to pull over, slide it in. It's always important to check because sometimes it looks like it is and it's actually like miles away. Tell it it's a hole. And so now I have a little indentation. And we could use things like, if we ever did print this off, we could use things like 3D, um, print it off and then use like acrylic paint to kind of um, make, design our new front door for it. We could also make it slightly protrude. So again, making that physical feel so that young people have that sensory awareness. And then if I wanted to do windows, I could choose the same kind of shapes or I could do circular windows. So we we'll just do circular ones for a wee change. This time, I'm going to get rid of my key rings just so that you can all see this a bit better. This time I'm going to select my shape. I'm going to use that fill zoom and I'm going to rotate my shape around. So I'm going to click here and rotate it. Oops, that was a bit too quick. So I can again get it. If I've got more senior pupils, I can link it to angles. So pull your line out. Go right round and rotate it to 90. I can then turn it again and I can put it face on. So this is going to be my window shape. So I know I need it to be slightly less deep. And I'm going to bring it down, go into home view. I do recognise as well that some people might be looking at this thinking um, this looks a bit fiddly. I promise you, once you play around with it, it's really intuitive. So now I've got one window. I need to check that it's actually touching the house, and it is. I'm going to control D for copy, or I could use my copy and paste buttons at the top. And all I'm going to do is drag that second window over. If I wanted to check that they were symmetrical, all I would do is click the shape, click the little line at the top. Oops, it's not what to do. There we go. So I can check here. When I use the little top hat, the little pull tool, um, it can show me it's 19 above the ground. If I repeat that by clicking it and just touching it ever so slightly, it shows me that one's also 19. So it lets me see really easily that they're accurate. Again, just making them slightly hollow so that if I was to be looking at my house, I've got two windows and I've got a roof and a chimney. Click and drag so everything is highlighted. Go up to the top and group. And you've got your shapes there. So I obviously didn't do it quite right with one window. And then that way, if I go around, I can rotate my whole model we can look if I don't want to rotate my base plate. One really nice feature of this, and I'm just going to go, uh, I should show you this. You can see I, they give you automatically, the minute you hit create design, it gives you a really wonky surname, like title of your design. When you want to change it, you can just type it and you could put in the name of the learner or the name of the model. So click on Tinkercad and it takes you back. Um, you can um, add in some additional features. So if I was to go back into our model, tinker this, you can see that I could download it as well. So once I've made it and I click it, I've got the option to download it. This scribble tool is really nice in early years as well. So I've got this option in here. So scribble, place your scribble on the pad and I could draw um, some trees so I could do a freehand drawing so I'm not very good at drawing but we could draw some trees and so I've got a tree and you can see it's hollow it lets you see kind of what it looks like and it'll let you edit that 
if you don't like it, because that one is pretty rubbish, you've got an undo button, so you can get rid of it, and you can use this fill tool, so you can draw with a fill tool. So again, you just squiggle where you want it to go, make your shape, you can fill it with the drawing tool, so you've no gaps, and you can see here, here's now my picture, I've scribbled, I've drawn, I could edit little bits of it with the erase tool, and I've got that redo, undo, and und over here I've got a clear button. Click done, and now I've got this little tree. So I could make it much smaller or bigger. I can also hover at the side and I can rotate it. So again, I could just make sure it's upright and I can put it where I want it to go. And we can make it green. So that's the squiggle tool. So if I zoom out, you'll see I've now got a little baby tree. If I wanted to copy it, but I want it to be symmetrical, I've copied it as we've shown using Control D or the copy, duplicate and paste. I can choose this mirror button at the top so I can mirror it and clicking that mirror allows me to choose what way around I want to mirror it. So do I want to flip it back to front, side to side, or do I want to invert it to up and down? So that's a really nice little tool that's available to you. A couple of other little things that I was going to show you. Um, you can, in Tinkercad, if you've got young people in your class, a nice tool, one of the tools is the dice. So even if you're until you're getting used to this and you want them to be more creative with it um, before, you can introduce them to the dice shape and get them to look at their cardinal numbers. So like placing the numbers in the right order, rotating it around. And it's just a really easy way for them to get a little bit more familiar with the program, but in a nice way. And again, you could rec recreate that. You could do a physical version of it and create it online or do it online and then create a physical version. What you can also do is if I just go to this really basic house, so that's the download button. If you download it, it looks like this. If I just hover that over here. So this doesn't matter if you're on a Mac or a Windows device, any 3D model that you download looks a little bit like this and your young people can interact with it and have a little look at it. So even though they might not be using the program, um, all the way through, they can still use it as a prompt and they can talk about what might it look like underneath, what does it look like above, etc. So thinking back to that using models from museums and libraries, that can be really powerful because you might not want them to hold something up above them and look what does it look like underneath, but this is a nice way to see it. So that's downloading. Um, really, really quickly though, if I open this model up and tinker it, You'll see I've got a few different options and then we'll, we'll flip back to our presentation. So in here, I can import an existing model. So you'll see here, I have to have a two or 3D file. It shows you um, object files and STL files are the most common ones that you'll find if people share stuff with you. You would just choose your file and import it. You can also export your design. And again, that model that you saw there, the black, uh, background with the robot is an STL file. So it lets you um, use your combined shapes to create an object and it lets you print it off. But it can be just used on your device. But these are the files you would need if you wanted to print it. An SVG one is if you've got a laser cutter. So maybe if you're doing some flat shapes or key rings. You can also add little notes onto this. So you could say, some, if you're doing it as a prompt um, it for discussion or you want to see what somebody said about something that they've created, you can add little notes in and you can get rid of them at the same time. Up at the top, though, we also have some additional buttons. So I'm just going to zoom out. So here we are in the 3D design. I can flip my model to Minecraft view and I can export it to use in Minecraft. I can also export it for Lego bricks and I could print out, if I had a printer, it prints in 3D Lego bricks. So I can use the duplo size, the mid size and then the small micro bricks. So that's a really nice way. You can't, however, export as Lego. That's one thing I would say, but you um, have the model that you can interact with and it lets young people who are maybe really invested in Lego to have a little look. Any ones that you want to export have to be 3D or Minecraft. It also lets them see what their blocks in Minecraft are. 
Okay, so, <coughs> oh, for your classes. So up at the top, um, in your ID um, badge, so the little icon, simply click that, and you'll see here I've got classes, moderate, etc. So if I click class, you'll see I did create a class. I don't know why it wasn't shown up at the side. So I've created a new class. And in here, I've given my class four people. So um, I've given myself JM. That's all I put in. That was the name I typed, JM. I gave them the login one. So again, if you've got pupils who couldn't cope with Mickey Mouse, like that would be your whole lesson, maybe typing that in. You want it to be really accessible. Maybe it's a way to enforce CPC words, etc. So you could use a letter and a number. And then all that you're able to then do is see this activity bit shows you when they last logged in. So when we're thinking about insights and engagement, that's really useful. To add a student, you simply do that and you'll see what it's asking. So you would say, um, so if I added Dawn, so I'm going to just add Dawn by her initials. I'm going to then give her a nickname. So I'm going to go D123 and I'm going to save. And I'm going to back to my class. And you can see there's Dawn, there's her username, and there's the seat. And so now I would see, because she's part of my class, she's in it, I would see when she last logged in, if I gave her that. If I go along to the end, I can delete my student. So delete it. Yes, I want to. All of her work would be deleted as well. I can give my class a code, and that allows them to get in. And that's the important bit. So you would give them that link, you would tell them their nickname, and then it gives you like a little breakdown. And that's all. That's all you have to do. We really would appreciate if you make sure that you speak to your local authority to check that we're not telling you something um, that is contradictory to the tools they would prefer you to use. Um, I mentioned you can do things with your models. So here we have that robot. You can import it into PowerPoint. If you're interested in that, can I suggest that you maybe have a look at our other recorded webinar on uh, creating your own museum? Um, it's on our YouTube channel, but again, um, we'll send out some links and things uh, to in the chat on this space. You can also, just for your own reference, if you want to use existing models rather than your learners, you can also import them into PowerPoint too. You don't need any additional stuff. Um, it's just where you go to insert. You'll need the desktop version, but you just insert a 3D model rather than a picture. Um, so what other tools that you can use that are not Tinkercad that you may be interested in? Microsoft has an app called Paint 3D. It's brilliant. Really simple, younger learner friendly, as well as senior pupils. We've done a thing with a V and A on it, and with some amazing art secondary teachers. So it's very friendly. A range of tools. Young people simply draw. They can import shapes. They can import text, and it allows them to then create their own objects. And again, these can be exported. These can be printed. These can be added into PowerPoint as part of a presentation. If you are interested in Paint 3D, I would suggest the Microsoft community. They have a whole range of activities, 3D modeling, um, and this scan. Again, this PowerPoint is in a PDF format, and it'll be in the shared area. That takes you straight to the whole bit about how to use models in your PowerPoints. Um, but they do have a class or a, a course on that, too. Other apps, if you have iPads, I would highly recommend freehand drawing app Gravity Sketch. Um, it's brilliant. Again, um, if you have a look, we're going to share out some links. Don's popped them in the chat um, that show you how, review, how you could use Microsoft Paint 3D and how you can use Gravity Sketch. Again, Gravity Sketch using a whole range of drawing tools. You can create and replicate whatever you want, and you have a range of export tools as well. So, because um, we're over, um, I'm just going to whiz through this and then we'll stop. So, there's professional learning communities in GLOW. Please check them out. They have lots of resources around this. Um, DigiLearn Scott and the National Technologies Community have a range of resources. Um, if you are interested in doing more of these, the upcoming sessions I mentioned with the VA will be live on DigiLearn Scott from next week. And that is um, Creativity for All. Um, so and creative design thinking. Um, so please do check out Did You Learn Scott? Um, and that just really leaves me to ask if anybody has any questions.
questions and to thank you all so much.